Hey everyone, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining me here. Uh, I'm Disha Patel. Uh, I work at NXP Semiconductors. I'm a field application engineer specializing in MCU. Uh, I support all sorts of microcontrollers and today's topic is Zephyr power management for wearable devices. So in this topic we will understand more about designing uh, low power using a smartwatch demo that was designed using like NXP microcontrollers. Uh, this demo will mostly help us understand how we can scale to like different hardware using Zephyr uh, and use uh, Zephyr capabilities. So uh, in today's agenda, I'm going to cover smartwatch demo. Uh, we'll look at an actual demo. I have it, uh, the hardware with me, but uh, I'll show you a video instead. And you can visit our booth later to uh, check out the actual demo. Uh, then I'll jump into the power management of our NXP Adatomex RT500 MCU, uh, which is being used for this demo. Uh, this is to really understand how we in include this in the Zephyr power management subsystem. So we'll go over that later. Uh, after that, uh, we'll also go over uh, the power optimization for display and graphics, which is really important. I'm going to discuss like most power optimization techniques, but uh, for the display and graphics, it's uh, like the most important. Apart from that, I'm also going to uh, dive into like memory optimization techniques, which also help us extend battery life. And after the agenda, uh, I also have like five, 10 minutes for Q&A, so please feel free to ask any questions that we, you might have. Thank you. Um, so I'll go over the smartwatch demo overview, just so that you can understand what are the components of the demo. Uh, so let's see a quick overview uh, before you know, I play the video for you guys. The demo is based on Zephyr Artos. Uh, it is highly power optimized for wearable devices, so that's why we thought of leveraging this for our demo. Uh, it leverages the features of power management of Zephyr and the actual silicon. So we'll see both Zephyr power subsystem and the uh, RT500 uh, subsystem that we have for NXP. Uh, the UI is created using the LVGL graphics library, which is an open source library integrated in Zephyr, and it can be used, uh, easily used with it. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a GUI guider tool, which is an NXP tool that helps you design graphics for the smart, smartwatch screens, which uh, generate code for LVGL, and uh, it supports the UI for the demo. Going a bit over the demo hardware, so uh, I talked a lot about the RT500 microcontroller, so uh, we have a evaluation board, like an eval kit uh, that we call an EVK for the RT500, that's uh, the top picture, and along with that we also have like a smart uh, display uh, that you can order off, off shelf from our website as well. So. Um, for RT500, uh, it's, it's based on an ARM, ARM Cortex M33 core, and it also has a Cadence Extensor DSP, uh, which is enabled with a 2D GPU. So it has a, a lot of features. Uh, I'll just cover the key features that we are uh, going to use for this demo. The demo, uh, the, the key features for RT500 in this demo are uh, the power management optimization that comes with the MCU, the MCU also has like a dynamic power scale, uh, voltage scaling uh, PVT sensor that we are going to use. Then we have the 2D GPU uh, for vector graphics acceleration. It also comes with a smart DMA that uh, transfers frame buffers to MIPI DSI. Uh, that helps us further reduce uh, power. Uh, we also have a 5 MB tightly coupled SRAM on this part, so that enables us to use a lot of memory that's required for uh, configuring like a smartwatch which is heavy on graphics. And it has like a ex execute and place uh, flash as well to accompany with it. Uh, the demo is actually available on GitHub, so we uh, we constantly make changes to it and upstream to it. So after this uh, session, you can actually go on GitHub and uh, try to include this demo on your hardware or even like use RT500. I've shared the link at the end of the session, so we'll go over that later. So coming to the actual good stuff, the demo video. 
So let me just, I hope it lets me do that, yeah. Oops, I just switched between screens. Okay. Mm, still don't see it. I tried that earlier. Sorry about that. Do you have any questions uh, so far about the demo, about RT500, about you know, saving power on wearable devices uh, with Zephyr? None so far? Oh, thank you. So I'll just back up a little bit. So this is how it's connected with the RT500, the screen I mentioned before. And uh, now we are going to see what the actual demo looks like. This is the startup screen. And we have a, what, a digital watch screen and an analog watch screen uh, that renders uh, using the GPU. Along with that, we have a lot of animations. So this is the weather animation with like a lot of uh, you know, background animations with the clouds and stuff. This is a static display of a uh, fitness uh, face of a watch that we have like regularly on our screens. This is the EKG. Uh, this might consume a lot of power because it's kind of always on. So we'll look into that later. Uh, the music face has uh, two song selections. So we'll be able to see that in a second. So it actually tries to mimic an actual smartwatch. And that's the home screen again. That's the demo. I have that demo with me if anyone's interested in looking at it later. And that's the two faces that I uh, showed on the screen. So uh, in this session, we are going to, as, a, as I or previously mentioned, we are going to discuss different power saving techniques, uh, most of which are based on one of any of these three key techniques. So uh, for the first one being reducing power in active mode. So as you can see, uh, let me turn on the cursor here. As you can see, we will be reducing, looking at reducing power and current when the watch faces are active. Uh, we'll also be looking for reducing current when the watch faces are in like idle mode. Uh, we'll try to take them into a deep sleep mode so that we can reduce power even in idle mode along with the active mode. Uh, and the third point uh, would be reducing duration in active mode. So if a watch face uh, is it's just you know idle, uh, we don't want it to uh, be there as often we can just uh, reduce the duration of that uh, particular uh, watch face and save power in the active mode. Uh, we have uh, multiple power optimization techniques and configuring them separately with uh, uh, k-config symbols helps us do that. So uh, we'll talk about this slide often compa uh, comparatively with the techniques that I'm going to share with you. Uh, those mostly consist of the k-config symbols. And depending on how you turn them on and off, you can save power in any of these three ways. So a little about uh, power management of the um, Adodamex RT500 first, just so that we understand how we include the Zephyr power subsystem within it. Uh, the power management of the RT500 will obviously affect the power optimization of the entire demo. Uh, we'll just be focusing on the core voltage supply of this chip, 
uh, which supports dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. So our demo basically works on uh, 192 megahertz frequency and a 0.9 volt, but you can dynamically scale it uh, as per your requirements. Uh, we can, you know, based on it, we can run it on faster or lower frequencies and reduce or increase the voltage accordingly to save as much power as uh, required. So these are the RT500 power modes. Our demo focuses just on the first three modes. We're not going to look at the last one. In the active mode that's on the top, uh, consumes, uh, consumes the highest amount of power. All the peripherals are powered. The entire MCU is functional at this point. So you're looking at something that's uh, uh, highly you know, not power efficient. So uh, we also have our sleep modes for that. So the sleep mode, the second one, uh, it's good for an ideal state. If you want your smartwatch to work in an idle state uh, in the RTOS, most of the MCU peripherals would be functional, but uh, it, most of them you can uh, switch it off and also retain memory. The next one would be the deep sleep mode. Uh, the deep sleep mode is much slow power than the sleep mode. Uh, the current con consumptions uh, drop significantly, so if you see the fourth table there, the VDD core data sheet. So compared with the sleep mode, it's up to like 11 um, milliampers. But in the deep sleep, it goes to about like tw 20 to 52 microamps. So that's like a significant uh, current, uh, say, uh, like you can save a lot of current there. Uh, so that's basically uh, the deep sleep mode is our, one of our most popular ones that we leverage in this watch demo. Uh, and that also helps us with the memory retention. So that's the reason why we, we are not covering the full deep power down mode here because it doesn't have memory retention. So we are going to skip that for this smartwatch demo. Along with the RT500, we are also using a PIMIC, a power management IC that we, we uh, designed practically for this MCU, the RT500. Uh, it is a power management uh, integrated circuit, and the part number is the PCN9420. It has four regulators, two switching, and two LDOs. So, uh, and it also has two PIMIC mode pins. So if you see those green uh, from the bottom, the PIMIC mode zero and the one, those PIMIC mode pins help us change the power states that we uh, saw earlier. So the sleep and the deep sleep and the deep power down. So. Uh, Two PIMIC mode uh, pins, that's four combinations of uh, uh, sleep modes. The MCU toggles these pins and the PIMIC will update the voltage regulators to supply a specific power. These uh, uh, PIMIC pins should, uh, like give us uh, four power states uh, that we saw earlier and we basically leverage those into our demo. So now that we know the PIMIC, moving on, I, uh, that, that was basically for, uh, all for the power management of the RT500, the PIMIC and all the features that we saw. So now moving forward to the Zephyr power management subsystem. Uh, so the Zephyr uh, power management subsystem is called a PM subsystem. And uh, this is the K-config that enables it. So if you can see the K-config on top, the config PM, it, uh, really helps you enable the Zephyr power management subsystem that you can use in the demo that you're working on. It's uh, divided into system and device power management, and we are leveraging both in this demo. The system power management affects the entire SOC. So in idle states, it will determine changing the SOC states. Basically, the kernel enters the idle state when it has like nothing to schedule. So uh, enabling this config, uh, k-config, config PM, uh, allows us to, allows the kernel to like call upon the power management subsystem and put the idle system into one of the MCO supported power systems. In the device power management, uh, the way it works, it, it works with nodes within the device tree of the RT500, uh, that is like various drivers, components, and applications. So these are two different uh, subsystems, but we kind of leverage both of them in our demo. Cool.
going forward. Uh, we saw the PIMIC earlier, so um, I felt it would be good to show you a snippet of the device tree from our board file in Zephyr that uh, shows how the PIMIC is configured at build time. So the regulators that I mentioned before, the PMIC mode pins I mentioned before, uh, you can see there are nodes in the device tree for each of the uh, regulator, and it has different settings within it. These power states generated by the PMIC are also leveraged in our demo. I'm not going to go in details of each of the settings, but uh, this should give you a good picture of uh, how a PMIC can be set up uh, in the device tree to save more power. Moving ahead, uh, this is also an example of the system power management that I was talking before. So in the PM subsystem in, within the device tree on the SOC level, uh, there are defined nodes in the power states. So if you can see, there's an example. So on my uh, left-hand side, you can see power states within the device tree are the idle state and the suspend state. So it's like runtime idle and suspend to idle. That's the name of the uh, actual power states, so they can be translated into our uh, shim driver the, uh, within the RT500, where Zephyr calls the idle mode when uh, the power state is idle, and it calls uh, the enters uh, deep sleep when it's in suspend mode. So it basically tries to uh, see uh, which state has been called within Zephyr, and it calls the same state for the RT500 itself. It basically translates uh, what's in the Zephyr subsystem uh, to the RT500 actual power mode in the shim driver. Uh, as I had shown a, a graph before where we saw those key uh, ways, key techniques that we can save power. So one of them, I, the first one I mentioned was the reducing power in active mode. And this is an example of reducing power in the idle mode. Uh, in this demo, uh, the watch faces are uh, in the idle mode most of the times. They wake up once in a while, they just render the, a new screen, you know, a new time or like a new uh, update that they have to show on the watch screen, and then they go back to sleep. So uh, this is a good way that the uh, demo actually leverages the Zephyr power management subsystem. So it enables the tickless uh, low power modes when the application enters idle task. Uh, this leads to uh, leads it to enter the deep sleep uh, static mode, uh, while the idle uh, it's idle for say at least for like 620 microseconds. There's a bit of a calculation with the 620 microseconds, but I'm not uh, uh, going to that uh, for this session. But you can check out the uh, uh, actual GitHub repository for this and the example. And um, so this uh, device, like in this demo, it either enters the deep sleep or otherwise then it will go to the uh, normal sleep mode. Zephyr's uh, power management subsystem also enables the drivers and app to lock out of uh, any specific low power modes. So we saw like we are not using the deep power down. So you can also try to block some of the states. You can only use a few of them. In uh, in doing this, uh, as I mentioned before, we are enabling various k-configs. So earlier we saw the k-config for the actual power management. In this, we have the k-config enabled as well. And by enabling this, uh, we uh, uh, compared our results with, you know, while enabling it and disabling it. So uh, we can see that uh, we can see that graph right there at the bottom. So this graph basically it shows. Uh, how a watch face just uh, is that awake uh, at a time to just render the new face, and then it goes in idle mode. So by configuring uh, this k-config, uh, we can uh, re like reduce power for the specific analog watch screen by 95% compared to when it's disabled. So uh, that's that's a huge difference uh, you can just make with like a one one k-config setting. Uh, I'll also talk about the dynamic voltage scaling using a PVT sensor. So this is a good example of reducing power in active mode. So we saw reducing power in idle mode. Uh, the PVT sensor that uh, is in, 
integrated within the RT500. That's a good example of uh, ac saying how you can use actually available hardware to your advantage. Uh, so it, not might, it might not be on any of the microcontrollers that you use, but uh, this is a good example of how to use uh, Zephyr with uh, this, ex this existing PVT sensor that's integrated within our RT500. Uh, this is, uh, again, a brief uh, explanation, but if you are really interested in knowing how the PVT sensor works, you, uh, there's also a link available. That's like a 20-minute video of uh, the working of the PVT sensor itself. And that's a, a training, so uh, that can be helpful as well. So uh, the PVT sensor, basically what it does, it, it allows, the, uh, allows to, us to optimize the VDD core voltage uh, that we use to supply the chip that we saw earlier. Uh, it runs on a voltage control loop. So if you see the block diagram, uh, it uh, runs on a voltage control loop based on the temperature. So ideally, the best case scenario in this case would be, uh, say, running the smartwatch demo on, uh, on room temperature. Uh, it basically optimizes uh, the uh, process voltage and temperature variation, and uh, I won't go deep into the graph there, but uh, it basically is a loop, so it corrects itself and tries to uh, provide the exact voltage that's required during like a particular temperature uh, that's, uh, that the demo is running at. So that was mostly our power management system for RT500 and the Zephyr subsystem. Uh, I would also like to talk about the power optimization techniques, as I mentioned before. Uh, I showed you most of the power uh, management techniques, but uh, I would like to focus on the display and graphics, because as a smartwatch uh, demo, uh, the most of the power is consumed by these two factors, so I, I feel like uh, this would be really helpful for you to understand how you can implement it at your level. So uh, I showed the... Uh, demo before, we are using a MIPI smart panel display. Uh, it's a smart display, and we only need to talk to the display while updating the screen. Um, on the MCU, the RT500 side, we have a GPU rendering, uh, we have a GPU that's like rendering images. We are also leveraging the smart DMA uh, with, that's within the RT500, uh, which efficiently reads the data from the frame buffer, and that eventually leads to reducing more power. And on the uh, graphics side, uh, I'll talk about the, uh, reducing duration in active mode. So the uh, figure on the right top corner, uh, I mentioned before the key techniques. So one of the key techniques was reducing the duration. So this is how we do it. We already saw reducing power in idle and active mode. This is a way to re uh, reduce duration in the active mode. So the GPU that's built in into the RT500, it uses a 2D vector graphics acceleration, and it's enabled by NXP's Visualite driver uh, that's ported to LVGL. So it's highly optimized uh, for any kind of like power-sensitive applications. It uh, helps the you know up, uh, offload the CPU to do other tasks on the smartwatch. So uh, it's a great way to basically offload all the graphics capabilities uh, from the actual CPU that's, uh, that's going to be, say, in like, sleep mode or you want to be active. So uh, that's a great way to save power. And uh, for doing this, uh, we have another k-config. So we're using uh, the k-config that's highlighted in blue. And uh, we have, uh, again, made a comparison of uh, when the k-config is off and when we turn it on. And uh, the difference that we've seen is it reduces the analog watch screen power by 14%. So that's a significant decrease for a graphics uh, kind of application. So uh, that's uh, how you can save more power on graphics and uh, uh, a display compared to when, when you're not using uh, the k-configs or using the Zephyr power subsystem. Uh, these were the um, power optimization techniques. I would also like to talk about uh, the memory optimization techniques. 
because they, they are also important in terms of uh, reducing power. And that's uh, basically for extending the battery life. So that's our goal for the uh, session here. Uh, minimizing, uh, so the first technique would be minimizing the accessing of external memories. So the RT500, the MCU part itself, is a flashless device and it operates on external memory. Uh, so it consumes more power and it's better that we would, if we are able to make use of the SRAM, the internal SRAM, that would be better for us to save power. And the SRAM for this part is flexible up to 5 MB, so we can leverage that to our, our disposal and save more power. And we do that again by uh, configuring a few of the K configs that are available. So uh, I won't go into the details of the uh, features itself, but uh, I'll, I'd like to highlight that just by changing uh, 1K config for accessing, if, for uh, making it not access the external memories, we can save up to 8% uh, on the digital watch screen uh, power by uh, that much. So uh, I think that's a significant uh, power save move here, uh, just by not trying to access external memories and just trying to uh, leverage what hardware we already have. Uh, so the second technique, the second memory optimization technique I would like to talk about for power, uh, for saving power would be relocating from flash to SRAM. So uh, we saw how we can save power by just not uh, actually trying to use the external memory, but we can also see how we can relocate uh, the contents of the flash to SRAM. So that's how you do it in uh, detail. And uh, Accessing, you know, we have already discussed, like accessing external flash would consume more power compared to the internal SRAM. So when you actually turn on the K-Config here, it leverages the large internal SRAM. Uh, the smartwatch app uh, is kind of too huge to be actually moved from flash to SRAM. So uh, we, we can do that in like different memory sections. So. Uh, we'll make use of the SRAM code regions uh, and put all the executable code there. And uh, we will see the details uh, going ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So um, I won't go into the details of this, but if you are looking for relocating all your SRAM details, uh, this is the way you do it. Uh, we've already discussed the uh, different K configs, but you can actually use the Zephyr code relocate uh, to, re uh, to use the read only data for all images kept in flash. So uh, you can follow these steps. Uh, you can uh, configure your linker script to do that. So that's a great way that you can use the uh, RT500 uh, to do that. Uh, this is the third um, memory optimization technique. So this reduces power in active and idle mode. So um, it's uh, basically the RT500 has 32 partitions within the SRAM, ranging from 32 to 256 KB, depending on how much SRAM av uh, availability is there. So each partition it's in itself can be turned off uh, in different modes, and you can actually disable the bus access. So this is a great way of uh, trying to see which RAM partitions are actually unused. And when you get rid of those uh, memory partitions, it will be easier to save power. So uh, it helps in reducing power in active mode. It also helps reducing uh, static retention power in deep sleep mode. Uh, the demo has a release mode, which uses like less SRAM and it powers off the unused partitions, so you wouldn't have to uh, use all the SRAM available and you know, just increase power. So uh, to, the way to do that is uh, enabling the K-Config, the K-Config smartwatch reduce RAM, and uh, we've seen in our observations that we can reduce the analog watch power screen by 18% compared to when it's off and compared to when we actually turn it on for our demo. 
So that was uh, the recap of the power optimization techniques and the memory optimization techniques. Uh, so I would like to uh, like you to remember the key takeaways uh, for the demo, apart from the demo video. Uh, so we saw a lot of k-configs uh, during the time, so uh, I've listed it for you here. Uh, you can use most of these. Uh, you can, uh, this is uh, basically for the RT500, but you can use it for other MCUs as well. And uh, to summarize, I really want to focus on the power savings. So uh, we can see there's a uh, table right there uh, that shows us how we can uh, shows us how, how much power we actually saved in percentage com uh, when we turned on the k-configs compared to when we didn't. And uh, this is all reduced uh, power or like reduced duration in active and idle modes. And we, this is basically to show how we can leverage different kind of controls within the MCU, within the hardware that you're using, uh, just using the k-configs or uh, uh, making edits to the device tree. So uh, that's a really good example of seeing a smartwatch demo, which is usually very uh, a very power-hungry application. So that's a really great way to reduce uh, power there. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've also added additional resources. So that would be the link for the smartwatch demo repository. Uh, this, I think these, uh, this slide deck would be on the website, so you can reach out to us. Uh, you can check out the actual repository. You can order the RT500 and the display. Uh, it's off-shelf. It's available on our website. So uh, you can uh, practically make this demo uh, on your own. Thank you. So uh, Q and A. I think we have about like eight minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I took up two minutes, two more minutes. Any questions? Uh, any comments? Yeah, thank. Yeah, you can go ahead. Thank you very much. I had a uh, couple of questions about the um, uh, RAM usage, copying the flash into RAM. You're using a custom bootloader. Does Zephyr have the ability to do that automatically without a custom bootloader? Right, yeah. It can do that without a bootloader? Yes. OK, great. The other one was um, shutting off the RAM. Does it know which banks to shut off itself, or do you have to provide a linker script or something that uh, shows which ones are, accept which ones are available? Right, uh, so you'll have to configure those, configure the SRAM, so you'll have to, from the data sheet, you'll have to know the exact RAM partitions that you're looking for. Okay. Uh, yes. So Zephyr can't say, I'm only using X amount, I can shut off the top ones. Right, so, okay. yeah, within the memory, like, if you look at the partitions, you can see which ones are not using as much, you know, you can uh, get away with, like, uh, shutting off power to those memory partitions, and uh, that's the way you could do it. Okay, so like you look at the map file and then decide which mm -hmm. ones to switch off. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you noticed any significant performance changes after you made these optimizations for power? Right. And specifically, I was kind of wondering if moving all of the flash into memory actually result, like, resulted in a performance boost, because you mentioned spending less time in the high power consumption mode. Right. So I know I mentioned those in like percentages, but I might have like some backup slides for uh, the actual uh, current consumption for the specific uh, RAM. So this, these are the... Uh, power consumption numbers and the graphs for PVT. Yeah, so this is the SRAM, it should be somewhere here. Oh, yeah. I don't have the slide for that, but we can discuss later. Maybe I can show you the actual uh, power saving numbers. I know like percentages don't do justice to the demo, but yeah, we have some uh, current in, uh, measurements for, for you to uh, actually compare. Any Thank other you. questions? Thank you.
So I'm, I'm making a, a few assumptions here, but it seems like some of those features, like the PVT sensor and stuff, are like architectural SOC level features. But the um, like the Kconfig seem to be like application scoped. Okay. Is there a reason why that's not like a system on chip level option? So uh, in like this demo, I, I was trying to actually demonstrate how we can use the already available hardware. So if you have a different hardware, you can try to leverage those uh, hardware features uh, using Zephyr. So that was kind of the uh, goal of the. Uh, I meant for like the RT five hundred has oh, the PVT okay. has, has the PVT sensor. Right. I'm assuming, but it looks like you're turning that on at like the application level. Like it's the config is smartwatch. PVT enable is that right. in the application or is it in the like the system on chip code somewhere? Uh, it's in the application. Okay. Right. Yeah, the application uses the system on chip. Uh, it leverages those uh, f features or key features that's in the PVT sensor. Yeah, but for that you would also have to know the working of the PVT sensor in the RT five hundred itself. Yeah, that's right. That's a prerequisite. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone would like to see the demo that we have? <laughs> I had one question. Uh, is there any wireless implemented in, with the smartwatch? Uh, not yet. Not yet, okay. Yeah. Are we looking for any updates? <laughs> any BLE or Wi-Fi? We are doing like Zephyr enablement with the Wi-Fi, but with the demo itself, we have not integrated it. It's mostly like like a, like a de demonstration, so uh, it shows you capabilities of what the demo can do. But yeah, we the other peripherals, Bluetooth, we we have not included in that. It's not a real smartwatch yet. <laughs> Thanks. Does it have radio peripherals? Sorry. Does it have radio? Does it have radio peripherals? Uh, no, not yet. Yeah, it's just the screens and the uh, display. Oh, that sorry, we should, the, yeah. the RT five hundred itself does it have a oh. Wi-Fi processor oh, uh, or a BLE So the RT five hundred, it's a basic MCU, but we, you can pair it with our other Wi-Fi uh, part numbers, the IW six twelve. So uh, that's already integrated. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, just a question about that uh, PVT loop. I was wondering, how is it configured? Basically, where does that logic reside? Um, how does it know? What does the safe operating limits? What are the uh, temperature slopes? How to compensate for them? Where is that part implemented? And uh, how is it configured? So it's in the application code, but in the device tree also it's enabled. Yeah. Derek, so, would, would you like to add more to that? So the PVT sensor is a block that manages or monitors your um, timing loop of your critical paths based on the current operating temperature and frequency. So when it sees that the timing margin is decreasing to a point where it might get to be an issue, it interrupts the application to request a higher voltage. And then the details to configure all that get pretty deep. And the link that she shared has an app node and a video and a link to our, we call it an application software pack with the driver to leverage it. Thank you. Any other questions about NXP <laughs> apart from uh, the smartwatch demo about any microcontrollers you're interested in? Yeah, that's all. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Have a nice one. And please